was perfect for what I'm going to be talking about today. Because he must have read my mind. <laughs> so here we go. Bumps and blessings on the road to our ascension. Well, some of you may be thinking, our ascension? Isn't that a little presumptuous? Or possibly you're thinking about you know, all of the faithful being swept away during the second coming and all the rest of us left behind. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm thinking more in along the lines of the Star Trek transporter. <laughs> now, you know, like, beam me up, Scotty. Some of you may remember that series, and some of you may be too young to even have seen it, so I'll just give you a little um, overview of what the transporter was. And they're in the USS, um, the, the starship, the USS Enterprise, there's a big round platform that's part of the transporter, and so the crew could go and stand on that round platform, and then their, their engineer, Scotty, could beam them up, and they just materialize into sparkling energy and you would beam them to another location where they would rematerialize and <laughs> it was very cool <laughs> I liked it um, so you may be wondering well what does that have to do you know with our ascension and well I think of ascension as, as something like being beamed up raising our vibrations I've even heard it described that um, you can, if you raise your vibrations enough, you actually exist in another dimension. And so even you may think you're in the same place, but you feel more joy, more peace, more, you, know, you feel less limited, much less limited, and your life goes much more smoothly when you're in that higher dimension. So, Course, and the ultimate in ascension was the ascension of Jesus, where he totally, he, he could erase his vibrations enough to totally dematerialize. Uh, but uh, what I'm talking about today is more of a gradual ascension, a gradual raising of our vibrations. And those of us who've been in spiritual growth um, in that mode for so long, We've been ascending for a long time, and maybe you haven't thought of it that way, but that's what you're doing. You're, you're gradually learning to bring yourself into that high joy vibration. And um, when, I don't know about you, but when I look back on my life, I, th I think I'm an entirely different person today than I was back there. It's almost like a past life, you know, and uh, I can see how much I have raised my vibrations, and and just uh, it's interesting to see. Um, I think I have a long way to go, unless I can find a Scotty to beam me up. But <laughs> but I'm working on it, and um, this the, my experience of life has become a lot more harmonious um, than it was earlier in my life. Now, what about the bumps and blessings? Um, I, I contend that it doesn't do any good to, to judge or categorize your experiences. Um, perhaps you've heard the story of the Chinese rice farmer. This Chinese rice farmer uh, had rice paddies, and one day a herd of wild horses got stuck in his rice paddies. And um, the neighbor came over and said, Oh, what good luck. Look at all the nice horses you have now. And the farmer said, good luck, bad luck, we'll see. And so then the farmer's son decided he was going to learn to, he was going to try riding one of these horses. And he fell off and broke his leg. So the neighbor came over and said, oh, what bad luck. That's really a shame. And the farmer said, bad luck, good luck. We'll see. So then a war broke out and the army came around and they were conscripting young men to join the army. But they didn't take the farmer's son because he had a broken leg. 
And so the neighbor came over and he said, ah, now that is good luck. And you know what the farmer said. <laughs> So, you know, our, our lives are kind of like that. We, we can't really, we can, we do judge, but um, it's my contention that um, bumps in our lives can be considered blessings. And I, I want to give you some examples of that. Um, three examples that I could think of right off the bat. The first one is uh, the Dalai Lama being just chased out of uh, Tibet by the Chinese, you know, he had to escape for his life. And that looked like a bad bump, didn't it? But consider all the exposure that the West was able to have of well, this, this man's wisdom and, and all that we learned about Tibetan Buddhism and their peaceful way of life. and. Um, that wouldn't have happened had he, had, well, it might have, but not to that degree, had he stayed in Tibet. And um, it goes both ways, too. I think they've learned from us. Um, John and I used to attend a, a religious science church, and we had a group of Tibetan Buddhists come there to chant for us. And actually, one of the Buddha, Buddhists, uh, the monks, had been with the Dalai Lama in that group that escaped from Tibet. So it was quite interesting. And um, John was sitting next to one of the monks in the congregation. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the monk kind of leaned over and whispered, I like popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> no, if he had stayed in that monastery in Tibet, would he have experienced popcorn? <laughs> No, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> so another um, another example is a very personal one, and um, some of you have heard this story. I'm sorry to be telling it again, but um, a couple of years ago, I had a stroke, and um, looking back, it, it resulted from this sort of perfect storm of not getting enough exercise, I was sitting at my computer all day and not eating right, even though I was eating the usual, what I thought was okay. And just kind of, it was winter time, I was probably bummed out about something and um, then I got a bad cold and the whole thing just kind of like and So I, I had a stroke, thankfully. It was not a really bad one, but um, it really brought a lot of blessings, actually, because uh, the, pro the, the uh, hospital where I went had uh, happened to have a program going, and it was an unusual situation. A couple of PhD candidates were, were doing this, uh, this program to, to see what the results would be of the, their nutritional and exercise program for stroke patients, and they said that um, they invited the spouses to join. And so John and I both took this program and um, we were able to, uh, just as a, a side effect really, we, I lost about 20 pounds and he lost about 30. And then our cholesterol and our triglycerides and our blood sugar and all just, you know, normalized. And, and that was very, uh, very much a blessing. And, John found out he was pre-diabetic and he had this peripheral neuropathy going on that disappeared and as he normalized his blood sugar and and so you know we really um, <laughs> I mean thankfully if it had been a really bad stroke I would have a hard harder time saying it was a blessing to be sure but um, I considered it actually good luck <laughs> at the time um, so one of the reasons that I really love coming to Nia dance here is the mere fact that I can do it, you know. I gained a lot of empathy for people who had really debilitating strokes and maybe couldn't even walk after that or and any number of health challenges. And so it also increased my empathy. And um, I was also able to see the relationship between my emotional state 
and my health. So this bit about raising your vibrations and trying to get into a higher joy vibration it is it's very practical, <laughs> you know. They want to be healthy. Um, I, I re recently read in a book uh, called One Minute Wisdom by Anthony DeMello that one way to gauge your spiritual strength is to count the number of times that you get disturbed during the course of a day. Uh, whoa, that's telling. <laughs> I mean, oddly enough, I was able to go through the whole stroke experience with a fair amount of equanimity, but like there's some days when I try to figure out my cell phone or, <laughs> or my computer crashes or something, then I go, oh, and so I, I need to, to work on that. And um, one of the, another spiritual teacher named Guy Finley uh, wrote this. Freedom is not overcoming what you think stands in your way. It is understanding that what is in your way is part of the way. Then nothing is against you. God has made it so that everything is for you, if you will do the work to understand this. And that is exactly the message of the book that some of us here studied, The Eye of the Storm. Nothing and no one is against you. It look like it sometimes, but <laughs> it's an opportunity. So according to Finley, situations of, say, limitation and aggravation are simply invitations, an invitation to transcend yourself. And you're always, he says, given a way to do it. So we need to be on the lookout for ways to transcend ourselves. And here's another story of uh, a, the spiritual overcoming of a huge bump. I mean, my stroke story just pales in comparison. Um, this, the main character in this drama is uh, Ken Kais Jr. Uh, you may, may have think that it's Ken Keyes. You may have heard of Ken Keyes, but his name is spelled K-E-Y-E-S. Eyes with a K on the front. <laughs> so Ken wrote the Handbook to Higher Consciousness, The Hundredth Monkey, Gathering Power Through Insight and Love, and 13 other books. <laughs> Plus he developed the Living Love Method of um, Spiritual Growth. Uh, and some of you haven't heard of him because he was pretty big in like the 70s and 80s. Well, what makes his story unusual is that when he was uh, 25, he had polio and he became a paraplegic. He could do nothing with his hands and feet, hands and arms. They were just useless. And in spite of that, he became very successful as a business person, and then he got into the spiritual movement and. Um, he founded a number of, you know, of institutions that were for spiritual and personal growth. And of course, he, as I said, he wrote like 15 books. And, <laughs> um, and what he said was you know, that he, he felt that, well, for one thing, this, this sense of like dependency and helplessness that you just feel when you can't do anything, and quote, it just drove him to be more active, to, to do more things, to, to you know, express himself more. And in his book, Discovering the Secrets of Happiness, Ken commented that his disability may have been a disguised blessing. And here's what he wrote. That's pretty powerful. Perhaps I would have been so caught up in the business and social rat race that I wouldn't have sat still long enough to study my security, sensation, and power illusions and then discover how to deal with them so I could open up my heart to loving more. My reality is that I am far too busy and involved in my life activities to have time to concern myself with self-consciousness in the wheelchair department. Today I view my so-called handicap 
as another gift my wife has offered me. Wow. <laughs> and one story that he told has really stuck with me. He had to uh, get his wife to help him bathe. And one day um, she got him into the bathtub and and then she had to go and do something and she forgot about him. <laughs> and you know, here was a perfect opportunity to <laughs> use all of his spiritual methods of, you know, training your mind. And one of them was, that, you know, what is, is. And there's no point in resisting it or fighting it. You're just going to make yourself miserable. So, and then he got, had another, uh, method they called up-leveling your addictive demands to preferences. So that, I mean, we can use those things in our lives. What's the point of fighting something that you can't do anything about, for one thing? And um, so, I mean, I know I have a very hard time not wishing someone would do what I want them to do or, you know, that kind of thing. But you know, it's a much more peaceful existence if you just let go. And um, so another spiritual teacher helped me learn that also. His name was Lester Levinson. And you may have heard of the Sedona Method of releasing, it's called. And this approach helps train your mind to release on wanting control, wanting approval, and Wanting security. Well, don't we all want all of those things? <laughs> you know? But the thing is that if you can release on wanting them, you can likely have a lot more of all of those things. And um, we're able to just give what we more of what we want by letting go of wanting it. So that's a, a little tricky thing, but um, <laughs> it, it helps raise our vibrations to let go of our addictive demands and our wanting approval or control. Um, you know, every time I get up here, I, of course, want approval, but <laughs> I just let go of that. I Actually, I, it's fun. It's fun for me, and I learn so much when I give these talks. <laughs> I really enjoy it. And you guys can think what you want. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> so um, <laughs> here's another example of, of letting go of one in control. Is uh, I don't know, maybe some of you experienced the power outage that we had with that big storm about a week ago. Over in Bloomington, where we live, the power outage lasted for eight and a half hours. And so it came right after dinner, which was a blessing. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> we, uh, you know, we can, can't do much. And so John and I sat in the living room and, and just read by flashlight. <laughs> but I was, you know, at first I was kind of. I was kind of upset because I wanted to get a lot of work done on my computer that evening. I had plans, you know, out there. And so I just had to release on it. And I was grateful that I had that, that technique and that knowing. And um, it turned out I just started looking for the blessings in, in that evening. And I, I was really grateful that we at least had water we could wash up, you know, and um, that. I had chocolate in the house. <laughs> um, and the smell of the rain, you know, the air, fresh air coming in, and the sky turned a beautiful orange. And, and then we just ended up going to bed early and sleeping in our comfy bed, and we were grateful for our comfy bed. And so it all worked out well, whereas if I had a gotten all bent out of shape that I couldn't use my computer, I wouldn't have had a very nice evening. So it's just an example of in our daily lives how, how we can use that. So one thing about, as an example too, of um, focusing on what's working in your life rather than what's not working. And 
you know, I know you've probably heard that, but I mean, it's really, it's a hard to do. I mean, I, because our minds, you know, Barbara's talking about the ego. It's like the ego always wants to tell you, yeah, but, you know, this isn't working. You know, if we just keep focus on, focusing on what is working, then we raise our vibrations and draw more of what's working into our lives. So, <laughs> one thing I was going to mention is uh, ways to do that is to keep a gratitude journal and then I thought, well, no, you know, I don't really do that because <laughs> I had to laugh. In fact, the reason I don't do that, same reason that Dilbert gave in, in the paper this morning. Dilbert's talking to his boss and and he's saying he's so overworked and overstressed and, and the boss says, well, why don't you keep a gratitude journal? And he goes, that would just give me more work to do. <laughs> <laughs> But I do, I do try to develop the attitude of gratitude. I notice things that I'm grateful for. I maybe don't write them down all the time, but I, it really does help to raise my vibrations. Um, and you know, if you have a, sometimes you have a situation, uh, you know, I'm well aware that people have like a health challenge or whatever, what have you that is big in your life. And so, uh, you know, one thing you can do is just to ask the universe to bring you the uh, harmonious solution to this and then just believe that it's coming. Just watch for it and just uh, keep giving thanks for the perfect solution. And, um, you know, Jesus wasn't just whistling Dixie when he said, it's done unto you as you believe. And that's a really a major point. So, um, yes, believe believe something good's coming. So we can also find things to laugh about. Uh, and I I'm really into having fun. I probably don't think I look like a fun kind of person, but when we were, when we were writing down our um, core values for the church, you know, I said, fun! <laughs> and well, the closest we got was joy-filled, which works. That works. <laughs> but if you remember, uh, Norman Cousins was a writer, editor, and peace activist, and he wrote Anatomy of an Illness, and he spoke about how he actually helped heal himself of a serious health challenge by laughing. He would look at old um, candid camera shows, you know, and just get himself <laughs> laughing. And he said he could even make the pain go away, you know. So just think about it. If the Dalai Lama had let himself hate the Chinese and gotten all bitter and angry about being having to leave his homeland, and he would have just taken himself down. Um, but in, instead, he forgave the Chinese, and he spread his wisdom throughout the Western world, and he even wrote a book on happiness. And if Ken Kais Jr. had let himself get all ruled by his frustration for not being able to do anything because of his paraplegic state, he, he wouldn't have... Uh, he wouldn't have been blessing the world with all of the things that he wrote and all the teachings that he gave. I mean, he really was an amazing man. So we can look at the bumps in our lives as blessings in disguise, an invitation to transcend ourselves to in this on this road to ascension, to transcend ourselves and live more in in a vibration of love and light and be more of who we really are. So bumps and blessings to you. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste.